just really want to invite you to join us on Wednesday to be praying. You heard that in the announcements, but I just want to add to that. You know, when this crisis first hit, the first thing that we did was to pray. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, we were doing weekly prayer meetings, uh, weekly, and they were on Facebook. One of the very many awkward things that we did in lockdown, those Facebook prayer meetings, and if anybody remembers that, it was basically just me uh, praying. So maybe it felt just super awkward for me and everybody else commenting, but we were praying. It was fantastic. And pr- one of my highlights of lockdown was those prayer meetings. And so the last Wednesday of every month, if there's one thing we take out of lockdown, let it be our commitment to be praying together. Amen. So that's this Wednesday. Uh, the prayer meeting's still happening on Zoom, and it'll be like that uh, forever. That's really cool. We didn't expect that. Uh, we did a quick poll at our last prayer meeting at the end of last month. Said, hey, would you guys prefer to be in person? No, and like over 90% of people staying you know, on Zoom praying. It's just a lot easier way for us all to connect. So Please just remember that. And hey, if you can't join us in the evening for that prayer meeting, at least be praying in the day for just those three things, for your own personal renewal, for corporate renewal, that is revival in our church, and for that to spill over into kind of revival for our country. So please just invite you to join with us in prayer on Wednesday. Uh, It is, after all, one of the one another statements is to pray for one another. Right, confess your sins to one another. The Bible actually says, James 5 verse 16, confess your sins to each other. Pray for one another that you may be healed. So I just wanted to slip that in there as we carry on with our one another series. So last week, if you were here, pushed pause on that series to kind of just acknowledge the moments and being back together. We're going to carry on with our one another series today. And the one another statement that we're going to look at today is really Practical, practical yet critical. It's a critical understanding for maintaining healthy relationships everywhere, home, the workplace, socially, in a church. And if you think about it, I mean, we always have need for healthy relationships, but especially now when it seems like there's just, you know, relationships are strained. Am I right? It's, It's just difficult these days. As I believe, as practical and as simple as this actually is, simple to understand, not simple to carry out, critical for us to maintain healthy relationships and therefore to protect community. So the statement that we're going to have a look at today is to bear with one another, to bear with one another. And it's found in Colossians chapter 3. So turn or tap in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to read to you from verses 12 to 14. And it says this. So put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Put on compassionate hearts, kindness, Humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, then forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So bearing with one another is different to bearing one another's burdens, which Justin dealt with in week number two. Bearing one another's burdens really speaks to helping each other in our struggles. Super important in this lockdown period. What bearing with one another quite simply means, to put it bluntly, is to put up with one another. It means to do everything possible to maintain unity and to maintain peace with people who maybe do not make it easy to maintain unity and to maintain peace. Literally, to put up with 
one another. And you know, as simple as this sounds, I love that the Bible is not shy of simply saying, and hey, if anyone's got a complaint against one another, that's another one another statement, it's a negative one, we won't deal with that one. But the Bible's not shy to acknowledge that in Christian community that there are going to be difficulties in any community, but also in Christian community, that there's going to be struggles, that there are going to be people whose personalities maybe rub up against you, whose idiosyncrasy, idiosync, you know, that word annoy you, frustrate you. You just kind of struggle to get along with. And what do you do? What do you do when you come across those people in community? Because remember, the Bible describes this as family. It's tight. And they'll be kind of distant and socially distant in a larger church. The picture is, hey, we, we get in into other spaces. What do you do when it's just really hard? Well, you put up with one another, is what the Bible says. So you don't make a big fuss or distance yourself which is generally what Christians would do because we're nice and maybe we don't want to make a fuss. We just like avoid, distance ourselves from people like that. The Bible says, bear with one another. Doesn't sound too important. Doesn't sound incredibly spiritual, but just wait. This attitude is a baseline attitude that protects Hear me? Protects relationships and therefore protects community and is so much easier said than done. Which is why in this passage it is preceded by a list of five virtues, five Christian virtues that have to be employed that you've got to unlock, that, that have got to be bearing fruit in your life in order to bear with one another. And actually, I'm going to spend almost all of the time today on these five Christian virtues, because these virtues that enable us to bear with one another and protect community. And here are those five virtues, in case you missed them. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness or gentleness, and patience, five essential Christian virtues for protecting relationship and protecting community. A virtue, what we call a virtue, is an inner disposition, this kind of inner posture that leads to a tendency to behave a certain way. So it's an inner posture that results in a tendency to behave in a certain way. And these virtues enable us to bear with one another. So let's work through these five virtues. So number one, compassion. So compassion is this really picturesque, it's like a really graphic word picture. It literally means to be moved to your bowels, to your spleen. I did not do biology through the matrix, so I don't actually know what that is, but it's really deep down. Right? It's really, really moved at a gut level. Think like gut wrenching. That, that's what the compassion means. It means to see somebody and see their hurt and be so deeply moved. So the inner disposition is to be deeply moved at somebody's pain, and the tendency to act is to help them in their pain, which is more like bearing one another's burdens. That's what Justin spoke about in that second week. However, how compassion relates to bearing with one another, to maintaining, protecting relationship and maintaining community, simply this. It's recognizing that everybody that you come into contact with in any kind of community, everybody is carrying some sort of pain. There was some story, there's some story, there's some hurt, there's some disappointment, some disillusionments, some anxiety, some stress, especially now, amen, and everybody's carrying that. Nobody's immune, and they're bringing those hurts, they're bringing that baggage with them into the community, into your workplace, into your dinner party, now that you can have them, 
and into your church community spaces. I mean, again, this is, this, is, this is not complicated to understand, but it's just stunning to think about just how quickly we forget this and judge people and distance ourselves from them and get all upset about them without even taking just that one step of compassion of just trying to understand what is it that this person is going through. And that's how compassion relates to protecting relationship. It's this inner disposition. It enables us to see past people's prickly personalities to perhaps invite, invite ourselves into their story to understand what they're going through, which at the very least gives us grace to be able to bear with one another. And again, it's just amazing how we skip this step. Have you ever heard of, I only came across this recently, but have you ever heard of the fundamental attribution error? Sounds all complex and interesting, doesn't it? The fundamental attribution error. What that simply means is that it's the tendency of human beings to, ab to attribute negative behavior, the kind of or negative behavior or frustrating behaviors of other people, we attribute that to their personalities, to their intentions, that's who they are. We attribute their negative behaviors, their negative, their frustrating behaviors to that's who they are. But when it comes to ourselves, we attribute our negative behaviors or frustrating behaviors to our circumstances. I'll give you an example. So, so let's say like I snap at Benjamin. Like I snap at him and, and like maybe people are around and I'm all like kind of after that embarrassed about it, you know, and not that this has ever happened, <laughs> hypothetically speaking. But you know what happened? Like afterwards in the car, like on the way home, like with Chris and I'll, I'll feel so bad about that and we'll talk about it and go, but you know what? Like I'm just really stressed. It's a really stressful week. I've hardly slept because of Emma Rose. Just blame the other kid, you know. Hardly slept because of her... You know, and it's just like, that's why, and he's just been like this whole week, he's been like, eh, and so I just step. You know what I'm doing? Like, I'm justifying, or I'm at least giving myself grace. That negative behavior was due to my circumstances. But when I see somebody else, like another dad, like snapping at their kid, I'm like, oh man, check that guy. What kind of a dad is he? That's one angry guy. You, do you know what I mean? That's what we do. We attribute people's negative behaviors to their personalities. That's who they are. But when it comes to us, give ourselves a lot more grace and understanding because of our circumstances. That's the fundamental attribution error. It's a real thing. And you can see that. that see, this, is, this is what compassion does. Compassion reverses that. Just enable us to go, okay. If that were me behaving in this way, like maybe what might be behind that story or behind that behavior. And so compassion just opens that. It just unlocks an extra supply of grace, patience, and ability to bear with one another. Does that make sense? Compassion. An essential Christian virtue in so many areas, but in protecting relationship. Everywhere. I want to say at home, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but we can apply these things, not just in church. The one another statements are written to Christian community, but if you carry on reading Colossians 3, it jumps straight into marriage advice. The supplies there. So we attribute negative behaviors of our spouses. That's who they are. Everywhere. Compassion. It's number one. Second, virtue that enables us to bear with one another, protect community is what we're all about this morning is protecting community, is kindness. And kindness maybe takes compassion a step further. There's compassion or like empathy is feeling that and understanding. Kindness is a gracious act of goodness. It's doing something good for somebody who doesn't deserve it and who possibly will never return that. It's a grace-based action of good. And again, talking about the, the marriage environment, 
in our pre-marriage counseling, Kristen and I went to a, a couple friend of ours, he was like my spiritual director, really a um, guy that I love really, really so much. He was also, still is, my coffee mentor. I have one of those. You should get yourself one of those. And we did, we did pre-marriage counseling with David and Pamela, and it was so helpful for us. And I remember because I'm talking about some of the essential virtues in marriage. And so kindness came up, and he explained it to us as a, hey, imagine, you know, you're, you're, having, an, you're having an argument, and we're sitting there going, who has arguments in marriage? That's not going to happen. Imagine you're having this dispute, like, and the tension is rising, like the heat's just going up. How do you just settle that hostility? And he was kind of saying, well, kindness does that. So maybe what that means for you, Richard, is to get up and make a cup of coffee. Not just for you, for, for Kristen as well. And that that will just like reduce the hostility. And man, I found that that does not work. <laughs> but at least you have a cup of coffee, and that's just always a win. But you know what? You know, <laughs> jokes aside, I mean, it's not, a, it's not like this magic thing that's going to reduce hostility. That's, that's far too simplistic. But kindness goes just way deeper than that, because what it does... And maybe it does reduce hostility sometimes. But what it really does is says, hey, I still love you. I still care about you. Communicate something way deeper. And maybe it's missing in the conscious, but it's not missing in the subconscious. And you're sowing roots. You're just pouring in fortification into that relationship. Kindness will always do that. Even if it seems like, it, you know, what was the point of that? Kindness is always working something good and something positive. It communicates way beyond the action. It can soften hearts that have been hardened. It can soothe hurts. I mean, it, again, it sounds, it sounds a little bit, but kindness is underrated. Hugely, perhaps the most underrated Christian virtue. Because you think of somebody who's kind, or you think of kindness, and you think it's just niceness. Well, kindness is just being nice. Kindness is a supernatural, generous orientation, inner disposition to do acts of goodness to people who do not deserve it and possibly will never return it. When we're acting in kindness, we're modeling God himself. And that's not just being dramatic. That's Ephesians chapter 2, speaking, of course, of God in Jesus Christ. And pause all of these virtues, characteristics of God displayed in Christ. In the coming ages, God, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. He would show that grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. If you're struggling in a relationship, struggling in community, try kindness. Third virtue is humility. Humility, like kindness, is underrated. Again, a humble person thought, well, that's just nice. In fact, humility is considered a weakness. Certainly in Bible times, Greco-Roman times, you were weak to be humble. And there's great misunderstanding here when it comes to humility. Generally think, what's humility? Humility is thinking less about yourself. Don't think too much of yourself. Think less about yourself. No, no, no. Humility is not thinking less about yourself. Humility is thinking accurately. Accurately about yourself. Ultimately, humility is truth. Pride is a lie. Humility is truth. Pride is a lie. A humble person knows the truth about themselves. They know that even if they've achieved amazing things, they know that has nothing to do with them. They know the truth. You might think 
self-made and I did this, but if you just like retrace backwards long enough, we have no choice over where we were born, when we were born, to whom, to what environment, what country we were born in, what particular abilities we were given when we were born, the opportunities and the environment in which we grew up. For most of us, that's positive. And you may even have the story that has a story of overcoming against great odds. And you think, but I did that. Except when you become a Christian, you realize, no, no, no. That was still the grace of God enabling me to persevere. Like you just realize as a Christian, it was all grace. Every part of it, beginning to end. Nobody who's truly Christian is ever proud and can ever boast of their own achievements. Because I didn't do it. It's the truth for the Christian. Humility is just the truth. And the truth is it was grace all along. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6 to 7. Paul is talking about this and he's talking about dissension and conflict in community. And him and Apollos and this whole kind of environment. He says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers and sisters, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, it was a gift, you didn't earn it, and if you received it, why then do you boast? I'm going to paraphrase, as if you did it. That's what he's, exactly what he's saying. <laughs> there can be no kind of system of better than because it's all gift. It's all grace. Humility is truth. Pride is a lie. Pride is lying about your team, pretending it was all you. But it works the other way too. Humility is truth. Humility brings us down to reality, but this is a good part. That was the hard part. This is a good part. Humility also brings us up to reality because you may be sitting there thinking you're a terrible, useless, good-for-nothing person, and you go, well, that's what it means to be humble. That's not the truth. That's not the truth at all. You are chosen, holy, loved, those are the opening words of this passage. That's who you are. That's the truth. And I've heard you know, other guys say, so humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking about yourself less. But it's simply just the truth. And as a Christian, you know the truth. I'm not worthless. I'm not useless. God chose me for the foundation of the world, created these good works for me to walk in died for me. That's who I am. But don't go too far. Humility is truth. Pride is a lie. Now, here's what that means for community. You mentioned it. That's why Paul writes about humility in community. Because nothing kills meaningful relationship like a dichotomy between superiority and inferiority. Whenever you've got that dynamic, of superior and inferior, it just kills the possibility for a healthy relationship, doesn't it? You know that in your friendships. You remember that back just from school, very clearly there's the superior group, here's the inferior group. It just never works, it kills relationship. But humility just kind of brings us all down to the same level, brings us all up to the same level, and protects relationship. So many of our relationships are killed by the law of pride. All right, fourth virtue, meekness. So meekness is, is the exact same word that you'll find in the Bible for gentleness. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Also underrated, also misunderstood, also just considered niceness, meekness, niceness. In fact, meekness sounds too close to weakness. But meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. That, that may be a revelation. 
Meekness isn't weakness, but power under control. It's, it's actually this idea of being able to not fight everything even though you could win it. I often think about it as like, you know, these guys, like, like an incredible boxer or EFC kind of fighter person who just like, you know, they don't often look like they could take you apart in a fight, you know, generally like, like a bit smaller. You know, you kind of imagine that person coming across somebody else, like picking on them and, and like you watching this and you're like, man, he could dismantle you. Like he could, but chooses not to. Like it's power under control which is an incredibly necessary virtue in Christian community. The ability to not fight everything. The ability to step back from a fight even though you could destroy the other person. Argument-wise, not speaking physically anymore, as we know that is off the table. But we'll fight everything. These days, especially everybody's armed to the teeth about everything and outraged about everything and will take on everybody about everything. Have you heard the phrase, you've heard the phrase, pick your battles, life, wisdom, true. That's this idea, you know, pick your battles. It was attributed to General Patton, US commander, World War II, who also said this, never fight a battle where you will not gain anything by winning it. Never fight a battle where you won't gain anything by winning the battle, which makes sense in a war. How silly would that be? You're going to funnel all of your resources, troops, you know, weapons, food, like make this great plan, like, like what's going to happen? Win this battle? And really, no, it's just kind of, it's what we do. Never fight a battle where you won't gain anything by winning. Makes a lot of sense, but we do it all the time. Think about all our petty arguments. And boy, does it happen in Christian community too, which is why the Bible is filled with statements, multiple statements. Do not be caught up in foolish controversies, in genealogies, in wars about words. Is it all the time? We just have this tendency to fight the desire to be right. It's not actually about truth. It's just wanting to assert our authority, intellectual or otherwise. Gentleness is stepping back, even though you believe you could win the argument. Listen, there are battles that we have to fight. But most of what we deal with that saps our anxiety and that destroys community are useless skirmishes that don't gain anything. Am I right? Apparently not. <laughs> It's just me then. Number five, patience. Patience means long-tempered, literally. Long-tempered as opposed to short-tempered. Having a really long fuse instead of having a really short fuse. We know what that means. It's really interesting, though, to think about patience in this way because it doesn't mean you never get angry. It just means take a really long time to get there. That's patience really long, long-tempered, long fuse, and when you get there, it's not uncontrollable rage. That's patience. Which you might recognize as a characteristic of God. Because it's not that God never gets angry. Oh, for sure. The holy wrath of God. And there will be the day when that wrath is meted out in just punishment. But we know God is slow to anger. Same word. Slow to anger. In fact, 2 Peter 3, um, chapter 3, puts it like this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with the roar. Heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. The earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. But for now, the reason we're still here and that hasn't happened is because the Lord is slow to anger, wanting people to come to repentance. 
So, a couple of nights before we were married, got some more marriage advice. Really good marriage advice. From Kristen's father. So Kristen, as you will know, I think by now, is an artist. Like, complete art. Her whole family are artists. Her two parents, her mom and her dad, are professors of art in paintings and in sculpture. Incredible artists. And so we're sitting down a couple of nights before we were married. Might even be the night before we were married. I can't remember. And Kristen's dad pulls me aside. And he's a godly, spiritual, wonderful man. And he's, he wanted to give me some advice for marriage. And I was keen to listen. So he's an artist, paints and works a lot with clay. He teaches that in particular. And so he told me this. He said, hey, so when you're working with clay, you've got this wet clay, and you get clay on your jeans, Here's how you get rid of that clay, right? If you take a wet cloth, you're like, oh man, I got wet clay. And you take a wet cloth and you rub on the jeans, you're going to make a huge mess. Huge mess. So if you want to get rid of the wet clay on your jeans, don't rub it off. Just wait for it to dry. And then you just do this and it'll just like dust off. And I said, thank you very much. That is incredibly helpful for when I work with wet clay, which is never... And then he said, hey, when you're married, you're going to need sometimes to take some time to let the clay dry. So you're having these disputes. And he would say, when, when I'm feeling like this and I'm angry, what I do is I go walk the dog and I just, I just tell my wife, she says, where are you going? And he, and he said, I'm going to let the clay dry. Just to go for it. That, that's, it's incredible the perspective that time gives on disputes. Don't just send that email. Don't, I heard that advice as long ago. Man, you're angry, hit reply, type the email. Do not send it till the next day. The perspective you wake up the next morning and read it. Don't just send that text. That's what patience means. It doesn't mean, hey, we, we overlook all sorts of issues and problems. No, no, no. It's the ability to let the clay dry in order to deal with it effectively. So, those are the five virtues. Spent half an hour just on those virtues, and that's exactly what I meant to do. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. When these virtues are present and at work and growing in our lives, that unlocks the ability to bear with one another. And so at first, when I described bearing with one another to you, it made it sound, well, that's not really that big a deal. But if that is tied to these five important Christian virtues, I think you can start to see just how critical it is in protecting relationships, protecting community. So don't underestimate the power of simply bearing with one another. It speaks to what I spoke about last week, not in here, but on, online. The power of perseverance. That, it's that attitude in community. Don't underestimate bearing with one another at home, in your workplace, in social spaces, your church community group, your ministry team, and in, con in this congregation. It's a baseline attitude that protects community. Without it, community collapses. And more than ever, we need community right now, don't we? So let's pray that God may work this out in us. So just as you're sitting there in this, in this attitude of prayer, just with your eyes closed and just reflecting, I want to read these five virtues again and just reflect on Jesus Christ modeling them, encompassing them, being the fulfillment of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus.
have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, didn't count that a thing to be held onto, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Lord Jesus, we're reminded this morning that this is who you are, how you behave towards us, and reminded of this incredible truth that when we become yours, when we commit ourselves to you in relationship, when by your spirit we are joined together in covenant, that these inner dispositions become ours, that you start to change us. And so Jesus Christ, we simply pray this morning that you would unlock these virtues in our lives, enable us to be compassionate in our homes, especially in our homes where we're far more, we treat each other worse perhaps than those around us. Enable, unlock compassion in us. Those at work. And especially in this community. Kindness, as uncomfortable as it is, as inconvenient as it is sometimes, Lord, help us. May you grow this fruit in us, Holy Spirit, we pray. And help us see the truth about ourselves, how at the same time we're in infinitely loved, chosen, made holy, and it's all grace. All that we have is grace. And help us to be gentle. To fight only what we need to fight. And be patient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.